Your Legislators is made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers. On the web at MFU.org. Good evening and welcome to your legislators. My name is Barry Anderson. I'll be your host and moderator this evening. And we have, as always, a great program for you with a distinguished panel of guests to help unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. I want to remind you that this is your program. We want to hear from you. And this is your opportunity to call in with your questions to 800-726-3178 or to send us your questions via email at yourtb at pioneer.org. We'll see that those questions get to our panel and we'll help uh, look at the issues that M the Minnesota legislature is facing these days on your behalf. We begin this week's program as we do each week by giving our distinguished panel of guests an opportunity to introduce themselves to you. And I'm going to begin this evening with Representative Amy Wozlowick uh, from District 38B, White Bear Township. If I have that correct, Representative, I'd be delighted if you'd tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, the committees you serve on, day job, all those kinds of things that you think they need to know. The floor is yours. Sure. Thanks, Barry. Um, my name is Amy Wozlick. I represent District 38B, uh, which includes Wiper Township, uh, part of Wiper Lake, part of Hugo, Delwood, and North Oaks. Um, and I am serving my second term in the legislature and uh, first got elected in 2018. Um, I serve on uh, four committees. I serve on the Early Childhood Finance and Policy Committee, the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee, of which I'm the Vice Chair, um, the Education Policy Committee, and then the Legacy Finance Committee, which is um, in charge of uh, making decisions about how we spend legacy funds. Um, in my day job, I uh, am a substitute in a school-based child care program. So a lot of the work that I've done at the legislature has focused on uh, child care and early care and learning. Um, that's two areas that um, I have done a lot of work in, um, but also that I continue to work in outside of the legislature. Uh, thanks for thanks for that history. It's really helpful, and we'll be back to you in a moment. Let's go to Senator Kerry Rood from District 10, Breezy Point. Senator Rood, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. You, of course, have been with us many times, and I think you're our most veteran legislator. I think you've uh, served maybe four terms or five terms. Tell our viewers a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, uh, Senator Kerry Rood and I represent Senate District 10, which is all of Aiken and Crow Wing County. And um, it's just a delightful place that everybody comes to recreate in. And my husband and I have a small independent real estate company in Breezy Point. We've been there about 30 years. And uh, I, in the, in the Senate, I chair the Environment and Natural Resources uh, Policy Committee and Legacy Finance. I vice chair the Environment Natural Resources Finance Committee. I'm also on Long-Term Care and Aging, uh, the Mining and Forestry Committee, and uh, I also uh, sit on the Great Lakes Commission. And um, believe it or not, I am the um, national chair, the chairwoman of, woman of the National Sportsman's Caucus. So, um, you know, uh, we, we live in a delightful area and I enjoy representing it. This is my, I guess this is my fourth term. I served eight years in the minority and six years in the majority. Well, very good. Thank you for, uh, thank you for that background. Also joining us from District 14 in St. Cloud, uh, Senator uh, Eric Putman, Putnam. Sorry about that, Senator Putnam. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. And in particular, we, before we began the program this evening, we talked a little bit about some of the uh, some of the classes you teach. I think the viewers would be interested to hear a little bit about that. So tell them a little bit, a little bit about that, if you would, please. You, you have a lot more optimism for my capacity to be interesting than my students do, Barry. Um, <laughs> well, but, uh, what, that, what that probably really means is I think it's interesting, and we're going to inflict it on the viewers whether it is or not. So uh, go ahead, tell them. <laughs> so my name is Eric Putnam. Uh, I represent District 14 in the Minnesota Senate, which is St. Cloud, Wake Park, St. Augusta, Haven Minden Township, a really fascinating place. Um, I serve on long-term care and aging, where I get to spend some quality time with our good friend, Senator Rood. 
Um, I'm also on the uh, Jobs and Economic Growth Committee and the Higher Education Committee. And a lot of the work that I do in the Senate, I find is in the space of intersection between those three different areas. We have a tremendous crisis in care industries and the higher ed and workforce development. Uh, those are all things that I think I can work together on in lots of different ways to solve a problem that is facing us that's pretty profound. Now, in my day job, uh, as Barry alluded to, uh, I'm a professor at St. Ben's and St. John's. And um, what I teach and study is about the history of public argument. So um, I'm a rhetorician, which doesn't sound like it should be a real thing, uh, but it is. So if you can imagine somewhere between a political science, a history department, and an English department, I'm right in the middle of all three of those things. Um, and Barry is the only one who wants to take a class with me. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 all, all, I'm all ready to sign up. We, uh, like I said, as I, as I said we, should, we'd probably talk about Socrates and we could talk about, uh, okay. you know, the, uh, in the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates and uh, all those things would fit right into your wheelhouse, I suspect, right? Yeah, I absolutely do. I could talk for hours about those things, but I will not. Yes. Yeah, that's right. We won't inflict it on the viewers this evening. All right. Finally, last but certainly not least, Representative Spencer Ego from District uh, 5B in Grand Rapids. Uh, uh, <coughs> Ego, we're delighted that you're joining us. I think this might be your first time with us. Am I right? Or did you join us one time last year? I can't remember. Nope. Th this is my first time on. So happy to be here. Well, we're, well uh, we're, we're delighted to have you with us. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Spencer Igo. Uh, I'm serving in my first term here in the Minnesota House of Representatives for House District 5B. So it makes up the Greater Grand Rapids area and then it goes <laughs> over to Cass County. So a good part of Itasca and Cass Counties. It's a really unique district because I have uh, the western part of Minnesota's Iron Range. And then we start moving into Minnesota's Wood Basket as we go over into Reamer and Pine River. Uh, so right now I serve on the uh, House Energy Committee along with the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. And I had the distinct pleasure to serve on the redistricting committee this year. Um, so those committees were a very uh, wonderful place for me to be serving here uh, and represent my region. And uh, it, it's been quite the experience. And I'm happy to be here tonight and talk about it with all of you. Let's start out with uh, some questions dealing with the issue of education. Uh, and I'm going to start with our veteran legislator, our most veteran legislator, Senator Root. I'm going to go to you uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the substitute teaching problem. I understand you've had a bill that was introduced to discuss that issue. And we're gonna then move from that to some discussion about higher ed. But let's start with uh, with your bill and some concerns about substitute teachers in our school districts across the state. Well, thank you. We actually passed this in the Senate last year because we saw the crisis and I think it had broad support, um, but it didn't, it didn't get to the finish line. And now my superintendents have come in and said, oh, please, we, you need to help us. We are so short on teachers. My superintendent is actually uh, teaching math right now because uh, they're short of teachers. And we think that there's a lot of people that can come from industry and actually uh, help teach. Um, maybe, uh, uh, you know, on a short term pace basis to help us out of this crisis. I know my own dad was, um, he taught at North High School and um, he was a jack of all trades and they really need an industrial arts teacher. They called them shop teachers in, in those days. And he was certified in machine shop and woodworking and the auto shop. And so they brought him in and then he worked on his um, school certification while he was teaching. And it was a great pairing for um, the school and for my dad. He just loved loved um, working with the students. So I think we have a lot of people out there that have incredible knowledge and in industry that we could bring into our schools to help us with this substitute teacher um, shortage. Representative uh, Wozlowick, uh, uh, what, uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, issue? Yeah, I think uh, I think we've all heard this issue from our superintendents, so it's something that we're all pretty familiar with as an issue. Um, the lack of substitute teachers has been a concern for a lot of districts, um, including those in my district, school districts in my district. Um, and I would say, I know that we heard a bill in our education policy finance or education policy um, committee in the House, um, and that, uh, that that was part of the conversation was what are we going to do about the substitute teacher issue? Um, I do think it is important that um, you know, I think one of the things I'm a sub in a child care program, so not the same as teaching, but I know that it can be difficult for, um, you know, someone who doesn't have classroom experience to come in and teach uh, in a classroom of 25 to 30 kids. So for me, I, I want to make sure that folks um, sort of have an opportunity to understand what that's like before just dropping them in a classroom. I think um, to Senator Root's point, there are a lot of people who know a lot of things, um, particularly in the um, 
in the CTE areas. And I think it's important to get those folks in there when we can, but also that they're prepared to handle sort of the what actually goes into teaching beyond the content knowledge. Senator Putnam, substitute teaching, your thoughts. I know this is a fascinating issue for a number of reasons. I mean, one, I've been a substitute teacher for a long period of time, uh, back when I was in grad school for a while before, in between uh, different programs, I was a substitute teacher. But also, um, my wife is actually a superintendent of public schools in District 742, first ever female superintendent of uh, 742, by the way, which I'm incredibly proud of her. <clears throat> but I see her in the morning on Zoom trying to find bodies to put in classrooms, moving the principals from here to there, the, the counselor from here to there, just trying to find people who can teach. So we're facing a very profound immediate crisis. But my big concern is that we don't make long-term decisions about a short-term crisis. Um, similar to what uh, Representative Wozniak was saying, I, I think that w when we think about people teaching, we have to think about discipline partially because different subject matters are more suitable to have people with community experience teaching them than others. But we also can't forget that teaching itself is a skill and an art that you have to work on. Um, you know, I, I am a teacher, I teach college, but I'm horrible at teaching high school. Uh, one of my, my substitute jobs was to teach second grade for six months. I was horrible at that. Um, and it's not because I don't know how to count or I don't know what paste is like. I know those things. I just don't know how to teach that age. So um, we can't forget that teaching itself is a skill and an art and it takes effort and study to perfect it and to know how to do it. Representative Ego, your thoughts, substitute teaching. Yeah, uh, you know, I, to reiterate, I mean, being the last one to talk about this subject, right? I mean, a lot of good things have been said, but the one thing I think I, I've really noticed in working with my community there in Grand Rapids is, you know, especially when we talk about greater Minnesota versus Metro Minnesota on this issue, right? In a small town like Grand Rapids, which is my hometown, you know, 10, 12,000 people, you know, those short-term subs, those community members do know how to teach, right? Because that member shows up into that classroom, I bet he, know, he or she knows just about every student in that room because we're still community-based, right? And I think when we're looking at policies like this, we need to make sure to incorporate that. Um, and it, it's been such an interesting, you know, me being a, uh, the youngest member of the legislature, a lot of my friends that I went to school with are now teachers scattered across the state in the Midwest. Uh, and I've been talking with them about how their independent districts have been handling with this, which has given me a lot of good ideas. And I know I've been talking to members here um, in my caucus who are working on this issue as I don't serve on an education committee. That doesn't mean it is an issue we all need to work on. So let's go to a question from a viewer who wants to know what our panel thinks about the University of Minnesota supplemental budget request. Um, are there areas that are concerning to members of the panel? Um, what do we anticipate the reaction will be to the legislature to it? And so let's start with uh, let's start with you, uh, Senator Putnam. Um, you know, higher education. I'm sure you uh, you're watching that University of Minnesota budget. Tell us a little bit about what you think about that supplemental budget. Well, sure. So yeah, it was presented to our committee about two weeks ago, I think. And we had an opportunity to ask some, I think, very focused and insightful questions and to get some deeper context into the budget. Because the budget's more than just a number. You see the number and you think, wow, that's a lot of money. Um, but when you actually get to talk to people about it and get some context for some of the needs that the U is facing, uh, it makes a little bit more sense. And some of the needs are infrastructural. Some of them have to do with, you know, you got to have buildings. Some of them are safety related. A great deal of uh, this budget is dedicated towards public safety on the U itself, which is also, I think, is an incredibly important need. Um, and one of the last areas that it focuses on has to do with the mental health of students. Um, and I think there are a few things that are more important than that today, um, not just because of COVID, but because of how hard it is to be a young person going to school. Uh, so with those uh, three particular areas, I do think that there are definite, definite needs um, that uh, the supplemental budget is attempting to address. Uh, Representative Igo, your thoughts, University of Minnesota supplemental budget. Yeah, uh, so, you know, I just had a meeting the other day with students from the University of Minnesota Duluth, right? That's a little closer to home for me. Uh, and the big thing we talked about is in the supplemental budget, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, anyway, you, I, I believe it's the number is $400 million, correct? Um, so what we're looking at, and they were telling me, you know, only six to 8% of that money is going to be going to the greater Minnesota U of M extensions. Uh, so I guess that's my biggest concern right now is if we're going to talk about doing a $400 million bill, which is a lot of money, there is no sugarcoating that. We need to make sure it's dispersed to our rural, um, rural campuses as well, because you know what? I, I look at my communities from the Iron Range in northern Minnesota. UMD is one of the places they go to get engineering uh, experience, teaching experience, nursing school. Those are great things that keep them in our community in greater Minnesota. Same thing for southern Minnesota, even Crookston out there in, in northwestern Minnesota. So as we look at this bill and it goes through a committee, I think we really need to emphasize that. Let's 
let's talk about making sure the money goes out to greater Minnesota and serves all our communities and maybe isn't so focused on that on that metro aspect. Barry, can I just chime in real quickly? Mm -hmm. Just go ahead. Yes, no, please go ahead, ahead Senator. Just just because I, I think that Representative Igo probably didn't see this part of the, the budget is that a big chunk of the promise scholarship is dedicated towards inspiring people to go to the outstate schools. There's a, a huge chunk of money that's part of the um, the actual scholarship program, because I agree with you completely. And this is really important. So I'm really glad you brought it up is we got to get people going to the schools in their neighborhoods. We got to we got to return the idea of the local college that people can just go to. It's cheaper for them. They can live at home and maybe they'll stay there and help build that community to make it stronger. But there is a huge chunk. Half of some of the scholarship money is dedicated to encourage people not to go to the U in the cities, but to go to the outstate states. I say that to agree with you. Uh, Wozlewick, your yeah. thoughts. Um, so I, I haven't, yeah. I'm not on a committee that, that sees the budgets and I haven't looked in detail, but I am a U of M alum. Um, I went to the Humphrey School and I went to the University of Minnesota for my bachelor's degree. Um, I know the importance of our flagship university, um, our land grant university here in Minnesota. Um, and I, I think that, you know, uh, that there there's always those unmet needs. I think every year we have conversations about um, budgets and every year, you know, the University of Minnesota, Minnesota State, other systems come with their asks and we don't we don't fund usually fund their entire ask. So I think it's important to, to think about, you know, having the university prioritize those things, what's most important. I think Senator Putnam hit on a couple of those issues, mental health, the public safety aspects, and then the infrastructure needs, which are really, um, you know, there are aging infrastructure on, on the campus in, in Minneapolis and, and other campuses. And I think those are really important needs. And I think it's also um, part of the of, of the safety and health of the campus for students too. So I think they're all important. I think every year we have these conversations and it's sort of a matter of figuring out what those top priorities are and, and where we go from there. Senator Ruth. Well, I, I think I'm glad we have uh, Senator Putnam on the committee because it's not it's not a committee that I touch in in any shape or way, shape or form. What I will say is as the legacy chair, so many of the projects that we do, um, the studies that we do, the scientific um, um, uh, um, programs that we do, all, all um, rely on the University of Minnesota, a land grant university that is so important. You know, the uh, aquatic invasive species um, uh, scientific lab is there. Um, we just did a boat study there. There's so many things that intersect with our legacy and the natural environment that we use the University of Minnesota for. So I can't speak to their budget um, request, but I can speak to how vitally important they are to the state of Minnesota. I don't normally get involved in the substance of these questions, but I can't resist the opportunity to jump in here a little bit with uh, the exchange that Representative Igo and Senator Putnam had uh, this issue of um, supporting communities in greater Minnesota also affects lawyer training questions. So, for example, William Mitchell has a program really aimed at trying to uh, uh, train up people who live in rural communities, live someplace other than uh, the metro area, um, to um, attend law school, mostly remotely, some on campus. Uh, and then hopefully the thought is that they would be inclined to stay uh, in, the, in their home communities and provide uh, uh, legal services. And, and I had an experience a few years ago where uh, the Supreme Court was giving an argument in a community in uh, southeastern Minnesota and uh, one of the police officers providing security, uh, turns out he was attending uh, law school at William Mitchell and could not have attended otherwise and then was going to practice law in that community. So these issues that we're, we've identified and discussed here um, affect not just uh, sort of generally an educational uh, framework, but uh, they extend beyond that. Uh, that'll be the last substantive thing I say today, and we'll go back to asking you questions and letting you talk instead of me. So let's let's go to Representative uh, Wozlowick, and I wanted to talk a little bit with you about the PFAS problem. Um, you've introduced some bills on that, that's an area of concern. Maybe you can talk about your background in that, in that in, with, the, with that topic and uh, tell our viewers a little bit about what's going on there. Sure. Um, so this issue first came up, so sort of on the on the um, heels of the work that we did to ban TCE. Um, so my first year in the legislature, we had, and I think we talked about this maybe when I was on the program before, but um, we had a company in my district that was using this toxic chemical. 
Um, and we worked, um, you know, uh, I worked with Senator Chamberlain in the Senate um, to get a bill passed, uh, I believe it was the 2020 session um, to ban TCE. And so the PFAS work kind of came after that. Um, Representative Ann Claflin in the House, um, she was a former member, she was had been working on that legislation. And so I just picked that up as something that um, needed a home, uh, Chief Author, and as somebody who had been working on the issue of toxic chemicals, toxic chemical bans, um, I took up the the PFAS and food packaging ban um, that passed in 2021. Um, and then from there, um, continued conversations over the interim and sort of saw what other states were doing on the issue um, and wanted to really um, uh, take a sort of prevention approach. So the MPCA put out a PFAS blueprint last year, almost a year ago now, um, and it really laid out priorities for um, sort of monitoring and uh, research and data gathering that we need. And then also um, legislation that that would be helpful in sort of uh, uh, addressing this problem. And so one of the ways to address the problem that um, is, is a more cost-effective approach in terms of how we deal with these chemicals is really to prevent the chemicals from getting into landfills and the waste stream and our groundwater um, where they can have potentially negative health and environmental impacts. So uh, this session, um, I introduced three bills, well, we have three major bills um, to ban PFAS and cookware, ski wax and cosmetics. Um, there's a few others floating around on juvenile products and apparel and um, furnishings and textiles. And so the goal is to try and prevent these things from getting into landfills um, and spreading the PFAS around uh, through that process. Um, and hopefully, you know, saving the MPCA and taxpayers uh, resources, time and resources, financial resources on the back end uh, with cleanup efforts. Uh, Representative uh, Igo, your thoughts on the uh, PFAS issues? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we've been having lots of conversation about, about P PFAS, right? I mean, started last year going into this year. The biggest part that when we're talking about PFAS, in my opinion, is making sure that when we're constructing legislation, um, that we're creating off ramps that make sense for all businesses, right? I mean, it's one thing, and this kind of relates to most policy, right? We can't just come in right away and, and pass a law with a mandate. Uh, it, it'll bring supply chains to a halt. It can destroy businesses, destroy jobs. We need to make sure and work with all people who are at the table or on this issue and find a common sense solution. I think that the key to the PFAS solution is making sure we have good off ramps to get off there because flicking the switch and turning something off isn't necessarily going to be the good thing for our supply chains. I mean, they're already struggling with what's going on around the globe and coming out of this pandemic. So um, that that's my biggest thing with PFAS is that we're, we're working to ban it, make sure it doesn't enter landfills and cost taxpayers more money. Not even that part, but making sure we keep Minnesotans healthy and, and the next generation healthy is creating off ramps so it works for all of us directly. Senator Putnam, your thoughts? Oh, sure. Uh, this is my turn to say I'm grateful we have Senator Rood here because she's going to be way smarter <laughs> than I am about this one. Um, but I can spell PFAS. Uh, other than that, the, I had a conversation with a, a, a constituent today, actually, about about this issue. And um, there are very few issues that, uh, there's a few environmental issues that pop up with quite the same intensity uh, in this area of St. Cloud. Clear people, clearly people talk about uh, uh, you know, climate and this concern or that, but PFAS is something that causes a, a real amount of anxiety and um, uh, concern. So I'm grateful that we're addressing it, we're talking about it. The idea of a chemical that's basically permanent is kind of terrifying in a number of ways. Um, but I agree that we have to be prudent and thoughtful in our ways of getting it out uh, of our ec ecology as, as quickly as possible. Uh, and um, now I'm ready to learn from Senator Rood. <laughs> Senator Root, we're all ready to learn from you. The floor is yours. Learn from me. Well, you know, it's a really difficult uh, uh, subject, and uh, we've done a lot of work on it. And the MPCA did put forth their blueprint, and it's available for anyone to read. And it's and it's really it really is interesting to see uh, what's in our um, environment. But I think uh, going forward, you know, there's over four thousand chemicals that are involved. Um, yeah, that are class of, 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 of this chemical. And so there's, I, I think I, well, they have a list and there's over, over 6,000 um, things that the chemical is in. So it's really difficult to say um, we're gonna ban these things. And some of the PFAS is not toxic. And so um, I don't think we know enough about this um, chemical um, to start banning things. Other states are um, looking at it. We have federal studies. But even California doesn't have a ban on the cookware. They have a, um, I, I think they have a warning label that they put on there. Um, there's only about three states that are doing um, 
uh, banning not, uh, of uh, cosmetics and it's only three types of PFAS. So I don't really think that we know enough about this chemical to be banning things. And I, I, I think we have to let our manufacturers, they know that we have an issue and I think we have to let them work it through. Um, quite a few years ago, we had an issue called microbeads and microbeads were in toothpaste, they were in facial scrubs and they, we found them, all of a sudden we found them uh, in the Great Lakes, the whole probably six inches of the Great Lakes was microbeads. Where did they come from? Well, they came from these cosmetics. Well, the, the manufacturers, um, there's a, a Latin term for it, but it, it, the language says intentionally added and none of them intentionally added this to harm the environment. So uh, instead of banning that, we worked with the manufacturers and gave them a time frame and said, within this time frame, you need to find out uh, something else in your cosmetics, in your products, um, and then not use the microbeads. And so um, that issue really uh, has gone away. I'm sure that we're still dealing with some of the after effects of that, but I don't think you can just go in and as a legislator ban something. I want to make sure that we make good, solid decisions, that we make scientific decisions. I mean, we give manufacturers and businesses the ability to make the right decisions. And I, I believe they will. They, there's no one that intentionally wants to um, pollute our, our planet Earth. So I think um, banning them and legislatures making decisions on products and which one's a winner and which one's a loser, um, I, I'm just not there yet. And I think a lot of people, if you if you read the report and the blueprint for going forward from the MPCA, I think it gives us a, a clear path and we'll get there. If I can right. respond to that, um, the report please, and the please blueprint do tell us Lazlo, Lazlo, that, Lazlo, thank yes. you. The report and the blueprint tell us that we should be working upstream and these bills are a way to work upstream. Um, and I also just wanna point out that we don't have to wait for the feds. We can be a leader on this issue and we should be a leader on this issue. Um, this is, if folks have been paying attention to news in the past couple of years, um, 850 million 3M settlement on these chemicals, 12.5 million in Bemidji um, to pay for new wastewater infrastructure. This is costing taxpayers money. This is costing, this is time and effort that the MPCA and agencies and attorneys and all these people have to spend on this, on these chemicals and trying to get these chemicals out and then installing filtration systems and it's it's having a huge impact on our groundwater and as we test more um, as the MPCA uh, implements their monitoring plan we're going to find it everywhere it's already been found in breast milk and rainwater and fish and deer meat and human blood and urine it's everywhere they don't go away and we need to attack them now and we need to do it it's not it's not a wait for the feds issue um, I'm certainly more than more than happy to continue conversations about how we can do an off ramp I think Representative Igo mentioned that that is really important, and we've done that in in past legislation with um, toxic chemicals. So happy to continue the conversation on that. But I think we can really be a leader in this. Um, we don't have to wait for other states to act. We don't have to wait for the feds. And I, I hope we can take some action on that um, in this session because it is really important that we get a handle on those chemicals. And I just would I would just say I'd, I'd really like to follow the science on this, and I don't think the science is there to ban things. And so. You know, I know we have a difference opinion there, but uh, I, I'd really like to, uh, you know, if they're in everything, are you going to ban everything? I mean, at, at what point and it, is there a stopping point on that? And so I think the research just isn't there yet. And, and being a leader on something is not always necessarily the, the way to go. Um, I'd, I'd rather see someone else, um, you know, make the mistake and not make that mistake. So I, I'm not there yet, um, but I'm I'm more than willing to uh, look at all the, the research on it. I'm just not uh, ready to ban with it being in so many products. I'm just not, not there yet. Well, and I do, I do wanna point out that we're not banning it in all products. We're banning it in three specific types of products um, and that's intentional. Um, the state of Maine actually just banned all non-essential uses of PFAS starting in 2030. Um, so they're taking a comprehensive approach and we're actually not doing that intentionally because we wanna we wanna attack this pro, this this problem in in these three specific products because we do think it does take time to implement this and we want to make sure we're able to do it in sort of an orderly manner and not necessarily having all these PFAS products being pulled off the market. So that is our intent here to try and make that uh, more focused. I, I had a bill uh, yeah. in, uh, introduced to my uh, committee that's going to take it out of ski wax, and I, I, I'm going to tell you um, how much impact is taking PFAS out of ski wax going to have in the environment? Because I, I got to tell you, I don't, I, don't, I don't see the impact in banning a product that has such little 
Lily fact. And, and I think it's more of a, I, I would say a, a political statement than an actual something that does something and makes, makes a difference. So. Well, we'll uh, we'll have plenty more conversation about this, and I suspect we'll be hearing from uh, uh, from both uh, Senator Rood and Representative uh, Wozniak uh, as the uh, uh, weeks go ahead in the session, and I'm sure there will be differing approaches on this uh, issue. Speaking of differing approaches, we have a viewer from Hibbing that wants to know uh, what our panel thinks about the differing approaches relative to uh, frontline worker uh, pay uh, arising out of the uh, uh, coronavirus. Uh, this viewer notes uh, specifically and asks specifically whether or not our uh, panel members support the uh, the House's approach to uh, frontline worker bonus pay. And I'm going to start uh, with uh, you, Representative uh, Igo. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that issue. We'll, we'll hear from our two House members, and then we'll see what the Senate uh, what the Senate thinks about this. Representative Igo, the floor is yours. Awesome. Yeah. So the bill actually was just on the House floor today. Uh, we had some, some good debates on it and some good conversation. Uh, you know, th this bill, let's just go back in time a little bit, started last summer with a working group to create the plan that was going to work to, you know, those heroes, right? The people that are on the front lines during this pandemic, keeping us all safe um, and finding out what that number was going to be. Um, so fast forward to today in the session. Uh, the bill was $1 billion for a fiscal note. Um, and, and what I'll say right now is I support making sure we take Take care of our heroes and give them that that check on when they need it um i'll tell you right now i voted no on that bill today and i'll tell you right now why i did um of the 67 weeks outlined in the pandemic you only needed to be working for two weeks of that pandemic and when it came down to proving the fact that you were one of those frontline essential workers while working on the bill or working uh, during the pandemic there was no audit or to make sure that was good uh, basically, the bill in the House, in, in my opinion, and, and a lot of my colleagues, when we went and, and read into this bill before we went to the floor today to vote on it, there's a lot of chance for fraud. Um, and, and the reason that that concerns me is because there is heroes out there. There's heroes all over the state of Minnesota that deserve that check. And I don't know if I want to see them being robbed of that by people that maybe are able to fraud the system. Um, and we need to make sure that the bill is cleaned up in that regard so the people that deserve it get it. The heroes get it. And that's what I can't emphasize enough. So I was a no today on the bill because of that process, because there was no audit, because there was no chance to make sure that it was done safely. And, 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 and I mean, folks, this, this is a billion dollars. This wasn't, you know, a 10 million, this wasn't a 20 million appropriation. We're talking a lot of money here and we have to make sure it's done properly so we can take care of those heroes that took care of us. Representative uh, Wozniak, your thoughts? Um, so I voted for the bill because I think it's really important that we're including um, all of the frontline workers that were part of the efforts during the pandemic. Um, we had child care workers that were taking care of the uh, kids of essential workers, um, you know, nurses and doctors and other folks working directly with COVID patients, had kids in, in the school-based child care programs. Those folks were taking care of those, those kiddos. Um, grocery store workers who are still working through the pandemic, um, folks who are in our meat processing and packing plants, um, just a whole lot of people who are, who are working through the pandemic who deserve to have that additional bonus pay. And so happy to support the bill. If I remember correctly, we did put an amendment on um, that would have a process in place for the, um, I think it was the OLA to have some sort of audit capacity. So there is there is something in there to that that regard. Um, I don't I don't think we're gonna see a bunch of frontline workers cheating the system. I actually think it's offensive to, to say that that's gonna happen, um, but I, I supported the bill and I'm, I'm glad to see that it's, it's at least on its way to uh, having further conversations. Senator Rood, uh, frontline worker. Sure, if I can respond to that quickly. Sure. sure. Go ahead. Go I, ahead. I just want to jump go. in there. I go. So, so the amendment that you mentioned there, uh, Representative Oswick, was was uh, to have the OLA go and audit it, which I supported. Um, but then, then uh, an amendment to the amendment put on to make that optional. So it's no longer required. And I'm not suggesting that heroes would go in there and do it. But in the bill, it says when you when you apply to receive the fifteen hundred dollar check. If it cannot be proven, the department is to give the check under the guise that you are indeed de uh, deserving of it. So there is no checks and balances there. So anyone could go and make up a thing about how that they were a frontline worker and get a $1,500 check, and that's taking away from the actual heroes. And those are the two reasons that I was a no today. I just want to clarify that. Senator, Hello, if I thoughts? can respond quickly. All right, fine. We're great. Why just, don't you respond? Yes, go ahead. I think the, the amendment, it, the reason it was changed to May was so that we could actually have that opportunity, but not force 
someone to do that when we weren't providing them the resources to do that. So I'm, I was happy to vote for that, happy to see it put on. I think it's something that we can have them look into, but I, I think permissive rather than requiring that is, is um, important to that office so that they have the resources to do that. Senator Rood, your thoughts, frontline worker pay. Uh, well, I think it's very important. I don't think we've had this conversation yet in the Senate. Um, it hasn't come to the floor. So I don't think we've fully vetted um, uh, what we're gonna do in the Senate. Um, I know that we had uh, our working group uh, that was tasked with spending, I believe, $250 million. And I think they came up with a program to do that. And that's what they were tasked to do. And so um, I don't think they added a whole lot of added spending onto that bill because that's not what they were tasked to do. So um, I look forward to that coming to the Senate floor. Um, and I'm not sure when it, when it, when it will be there. I'm not on the, the working group. Senator Putnam. Yeah, so I'm actually a co-author of this bill in the Senate. And um, like Senator Root, I can't wait to actually get a chance to talk about it on the floor. Um, once we get it passed and actually get relief and respect the people who worked so hard uh, over the past two years, um, but also so that we can iron it out and make it as perfect as we can. Um, you know, uh, one of the big sticking points in the initial formulation of this, when we agreed to spend $250 million, so we're really talking about an additional $750 million, but $250 million was already kind of committed to. Um, and in that initial plan, one of the sticky points was what counted as a frontline worker. Uh, and I think that there was a good argument that said you had to be in direct exposure to COVID patients. But I thought about that a lot since then. Um, and I now believe that a more expansive definition of what a frontline worker is makes a lot more sense. Because when you think about that nurse who had to go to work and had to take care of people in a COVID wing, there's a good chance that he or she had to take a bus to get there. And the person who drove that bus was just as exposed to COVID as was the nurse. And that nurse wouldn't have gotten there to do that job if that bus driver hadn't showed up. And we can't for a second think that a public bus is in any way more hygienic than where that nurse was working. So uh, there are so many people who contributed so much. Think of the meatpacking plant workers. You know, uh, without them, we wouldn't have bacon, which is a tragedy of its own, but we also wouldn't have a surplus. The surplus is a direct function of these people going out to work. It's, it's a direct math situation. I mean, that's, that's why we have a surplus is because people went out to work over the last two years. So when we talk about returning the surplus to taxpayers, to people who earned it, this is a great way to think about that. The surplus is a direct function of that bus driver, of that meatpacking plant worker. Um, and I think that this is a fully appropriate and morally appropriate, as well as practically, way of uh, using these resources. So we have a question from a viewer who wants to, uh, wants to um, or is wondering where we're at with respect to potential additional resources going into transportation issues. And uh, I think, uh, of course, this is a bonding year, so th there's some aspects uh, uh, of the bonding bill that, of course, will deal with transportation. And, of course, uh, there's also a surplus, so transportation issues may be an issue there as well. Um, let's start with you, Representative Wozlowick. What do you, what's your view on the uh, transportation issues that the viewers are concerned about? What, what are we likely to see in this session dealing with transportation questions? Sure. Well, I think uh, one big thing is going to be uh, we have a whole bunch of money coming to the state from the infrastructure bill that was passed at the uh, federal level. Um, and so that'll be a key piece of the conversation around um, infrastructure related to transportation. Um, that's going to be a big piece of it. I know there has been um, conversation to state level around, um, you know, the long term plans that we have for um, rapid bus transit, um, other sort of uh, rapid transit um, lines that are going in around the metro area and expanding from the metro area. That's going to be a continued conversation, I think, um, for a lot of communities who are who are um, ha who have those lines now and who will um, be getting those lines in the future. Um, beyond that, I, I'm not on the transportation committee, so I can't speak to exactly what they're considering, but I know there is conversation around multimodal, you know, wanting to have access for everyone, whether that's pedestrians, uh, bikers, folks who take public transit and those driving who are driving. So I think I think we're going to see a pretty big investment in terms of um, transportation infrastructure, roads and bridges, all that sort of stuff um, as we get the money from the, the federal, the feds the, that passed in the infrastructure bill and then whatever the state decides to do as well. Senator Rood, transportation issues. Well, I think we're going to see some really robust spending, and and if you drive around St. Paul, um, you 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 know, and in a and the um, 
pothole swallows up your car. I, I think we uh, we need to do a better job on our roads. Um, and, and so I think we're going to have, um, uh, like Representative Waslowick said, we're going to have a, a really robust, it'll be federal, it'll be bonding. I think you'll see some cash payments. I think today uh, in the Senate, we saw some um, bills to uh, dedicate the um, from the sales of auto parts. Um, we did that in 2017 with with tires. And so some of the things, uh, some more dedicated funder for the roads and bridges. I think that's something we always pretty much unify on. Um, in greater Minnesota, we, you know, folks love to come to greater Minnesota and we need to have good roads to bring them there. And then we also have trouble with our, our bridges in, in greater Minnesota because our townships um, really don't have the ability to um, have the money to build those bridges. And so they really need some help in some of the rural areas uh, with that infrastructure. So I think it's something we all agree on that, that we want a robust transportation package. Senator Putnam, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with uh, the conversation to this point. I think it's the most interesting dimension of transportation in the next couple months in the legislature is gonna be who pays for what? Because we have these different uh, buckets of, of resources and we have all of these different problems. I mean, I think we talk about transportation, we have to acknowledge that we have underfunded and underinvested in transportation and in our transportation infrastructure for many, many years. So we really have a lot of catching up to do, but we need to do more than catch up. And this is a great opportunity to do that because we have the federal funds, we have the surplus and we have bonding. We have opportunities, not just to make up for lost time. And there's been a tremendous amount of it, but also opportunities to anticipate what comes next. You know, we've got all kinds of uh, changes in, in life patterns. Uh, it's gonna take us a little while to figure out uh, how we're gonna commute, how we're gonna get around in a post COVID world. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to think about those issues as we think about where and how we invest in transportation infrastructure moving forward. Uh, uh, Senator Rood, your thoughts? Oh, you already got me. <laughs> oh yeah, I got you, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, uh, Representative Agbo, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, um, you know, kind of a lot of uh, tones here that I think we all share. I think uh, number one thing that comes to my mind when we talk transportation right away, is focusing on our local governments, whether that be counties and townships and small cities. They're the ones that are, are in plight, frankly, that need to make sure and take care of a lot of roads. And we go to greater Minnesota. I mean, some of these townships and counties take care of tens of thousands of miles um, and they do it with just their local tax base. Um, so if there's ways we can help there, I think that's vitally important. Um, and, you know, whether that be bonding or our surplus, you know, I will say, and for those watching, I'm a little, I'm holding my breath a little on those federal funds because right now they are approved um, by law, but they have not been appropriated. And that's because right now Congress is acting under a continuing resolution. So until I see that that passed and the, and the continuing resolution is completed and we can move on and I can see that funded properly and appropriated, then we can start thinking about it. But I think as of right now, it might be a little too bullish to start thinking about those funds until we see that completed. So we have a question from a viewer who wants, who, who noticed uh, the coverage of uh, uh, the recent uh, food fraud cases coming to light in the Twin Cities. And the viewer is wondering whether or not there might be some changes in legislation that would result uh, as a result of uh, some of that uh, activity. Um, obviously, there's a lot we don't know. And it's important to recall that uh, these are allegations. They're not necessarily proven. So those are there are some due process kinds of issues that lurk at the bottom of this we have to be conscious of. But let's start with you, Senator Rood. Um, uh, since I screwed it up here last time, we'll go to you first here. And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about this question, whether or not you think the legislature is going to take any action uh, in this legislative session on that particular problem. The floor is yours. Uh, and I'll be really quick because I have not followed this pro this at all because it's just not in my wheelhouse and uh, I have I, I have many other things and I'm sure that I have three other experts here but I have not followed that issue. All right, very good, uh, 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 Representative uh, Waslewick, your thoughts. Um, so I think, like Senator Rood, not in my wheelhouse, but I think there's a lot of information we still don't know. And I think with the ongoing investigation, we'll find out more. Um, what I do know, um, at least what I've heard, and I won't say this is proven because I don't know what, what has, but when I, what I've heard from MDE um, was that they had tried to stop payments because they had suspicions about some activities that were going on, and then they were overruled by the courts. Um, and so I think there's, certainly we can have conversations around if there was, if there was something missed 
on their part, but I, I really think, um, I, I don't know what the exact answer is, but I think we'll, as we learn more about the investigation and more things become public, that we'll have a better opportunity to understand what went wrong and hopefully make some fixes, um, whether that's through the legislation, the legislature or um, through agencies and how their process works. All right, Senator Putnam. Uh, well, at the risk of redundancy, this is hardly my area of expertise either. Uh, but uh, I, I would say that, uh, you know, people do bad stuff sometimes. They do, you know, uh, and um, we have to be vigilant and try and decrease the opportunities for bad stuff to be done by people. Uh, and uh, one of the ways that we can do that, I think, uh, well, two things I think are important as we think about this. One is not to focus on any specific industry or any specific individual in any specific situation. Realize that people do bad stuff in lots of different places and lots of different ways uh, with lots of different opportunities. Uh, but the second thing I think is uh, we have to think about how we fund the agencies who investigate these issues. Um, you know, everyone has been uh, incredibly overworked over the last couple of years and our agencies are underfunded in their capacity to have the, the person power to investigate some things sometimes. So I think that's another thing to keep uh, uh, on the radar is how we support those agencies who are responsible for oversight. Um, it, it's really easy for us as legislators to come up with new laws that say, you have to do this, you have to do that. But it's hard, I think, and it takes some political courage to actually put the resources into those people who have to enforce those rules. Okay, right. And finally, uh, last but certainly not least, Representative Igo, your thoughts on this particular uh, issue? You know, like those before me, I'm not too versed on this issue. Uh, like I said, I think this show, I think this gives me a great opportunity for something I need to look into. You know, um, I think all of us um, kind of focus on our own expertise areas that are created by our constituents. You know, that's why I ran for office. That's, those are the issues I carry. I have a playbook that I bring to St. Paul and it's the ideas for my communities. And my communities, I, I haven't heard about this issue yet. So, for me to speak too much about it uh, would, would be wrong, but I, you know, I will be looking into it because the more versed I am on things, the better legislator I can be for not only my constituents, but the state of Minnesota. So uh, we have a question from uh, a viewer about education generally, and I'm gonna to go to you, Senator Putnam first, because I think what we're dealing with here is a concern about uh, what I would call K-12, it's now pre-K to 12, and whether or not there will be additional uh, dollars appropriated this year and of course, this is typically not a funding year, but of course there is the surplus question. Uh, and this viewer is wondering whether or not some of that money might filter down to uh, school districts uh, more generally. So let's start with you, Senator Putnam. We'll go around our virtual table. The floor is yours. Sure, thank you, Barry. And uh, thank you to the, to the watcher who submitted this question, because I think there are a few things that are more important than public education. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's the path to the middle class, it's the path to improving your lives, it's the path to becoming a good citizen. That's why we have public schools is not just to get people jobs, but to make them into good citizens. And so few things are more important uh, than uh, education. Um, uh, you did, I think it was appropriate for you to say it's over E12 instead of K12, because we're also talking about early childhood education, where it's a space where if we invest in that as a state, the return on that investment is phenomenal. If we take care of kids when they're really younger, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a, the appropriate and right time to, to put them on the right path. So uh, in terms of like actual resources coming to the schools, I expect that there will be some. I'm not entirely sure where it's going and where I can tell you where I'd like it to go, though. Um, I would like to see that investment in early childhood education, um, but also coupled with a greater investment in uh, mental health concerns and counseling. You know, this is a, a fact that everybody knows. We've heard a million times over and over again that Minnesota has the fourth worst ratio of uh, guidance counselors to students in the country. Um, and when you add in uh, school social workers and psychologists, we're actually the worst in the country. Um, and that's pre-COVID. Um, it's hard to be a young person these days. And with so many of the issues people are struggling with, there's this, this current of nihilism where, where, where young people don't believe in anything. They're not a, they, they don't have the support to do the things that they can uh, eventually do. We need more grown-ups in the buildings to serve as mentors, to help young people become active, contributing members of society, healthy-minded citizens. Uh, so that's where I'd like to see it go. Um, I'm not entirely sure what kinds of resources are likely to be articulated to E12 education, but I do hope there's some. So Representative Igo, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, uh, this is a, a subject, you know, what I don't serve on an education committee, but it, it's a subject that's close to home for me. And 
I, I think that personally comes from my family experience. Uh, my youngest brother um, graduated high school and started his college experience in the middle of COVID. Um, having conversations with him and his friends who are like brothers to me, um, I really saw firsthand how that affected them. And you know, going back to my high school and talking to my old teachers, um, kind of giving me some ideas of where that, you know, if we're going to appropriate money to education to help and um, the idea that I really come with. And, and, you know, Senator Putnam, you kind of mentioned this in your last question, you know, taking um, some leadership and that political courage. I think the biggest thing here is creating programs that are going to create um, hands up for educational policy rather than a, in a one time handout. Right. I mean, it's really easy to say we're going to write a check for one hundred and fifty million dollars to all of our school districts and poof, the money's gone. That's taxpayer dollars disappeared forever. And maybe it made a difference for that year to help balance the budget. But I think we really want to start making change and whether that be mental health for the next generation, whether it be more teachers, whether it be helping to create more diversified programs um, in, in the trades or, or career paths, we need to create a, a bill and policy that's going to give hands up to local school districts to allow them to work together, to share ideas and to really get that money to be used to make students lives better uh, and, and make the next generation better. And, you know, it's the line that I use in my constituents and I really believe in bring our best days to reality. Representative uh, Laswell. Yeah, so I, I think uh, Senator Putnam stole a little of my thunder there with the early education stuff, but that's a that's a big an area that I think is is a really important. Investment and that is in and fact sort of your wheelhouse. That's that's a place that <laughs> you, you know a yeah, great deal about. That I return topic. your thunder. I return your thunder to yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just watched the movie Thor, so that's really important to me that I have my thunder <laughs> back. Um, anyways, um, so I think I think early education is really important. Um, I think. Uh, Senator Put Putnam mentioned the the return on investment on that is huge, um, and it's really vital that we address that, that those issues and and sort of what we're seeing there on the early education part. I would also say uh, cross subsidy for special education is a huge one that I'm hearing about from the districts in my uh, in my communities, and so I think um, that's the essentially the gap between what the state uh, and the federal governments um, cover for special education services which are mandated by the government that school districts provide them. Um, and this is a huge expense for a lot of districts across the state. And so that's one thing that I think um, we've had agreement on in the past. And I would love to see us uh, continue to, to work to minimize the gaps for and to be able to provide the for those. Senator Rood. Well, Representative Waslewick, I love the fact that you always, I can tell you work with children because you always say my kiddos. And I, <laughs> I just... <laughs> I just, I just love that. I think that's just, uh, that's, that's very nice. Anyway, um, so last year we made the largest investment in uh, Minnesota schools in the history of Minnesota and uh, with very little mandates. So I'm not thinking that we're looking at a big spending package. I probably look at some things that happened in COVID that the schools no, need help with. But when I talk to my superintendents, they're saying, you know, money isn't the solution to end everything. And what would really like is more local control of our schools. My superintendents know their schools. They know what their community needs. And so they're asking to take off uh, mandates and they, they have a list of mandates that they would like to see go away that um, makes it easier for them to run their schools because they're not Minneapolis schools, uh, they're greater Minnesota schools. And they're usually pretty small community schools. And uh, like Representative Igo says, um, we know our kids, um, the, community knows our kids, and I think our superintendents know best what the children in that district need. So I, I'm looking more for taking off uh, mandates for our schools um, than just throwing funding at them. So I'd like to anticipate a question that we often get, and I wanna to go to you, Senator Rood, uh, just in the very only couple of minutes we have left, uh, and that is, uh, a question dealing with the legacy funding and what the what might be coming out of the legacy program. So can you talk very briefly about that? Maybe we can get everybody in on this, but we'll try to get as many in as we can. Sure. Um, last year, our legacy bill was $700 million and we passed it off unanimously off the Senate. Probably uh, uh, one of my best accomplishments was that. It was an amazing bill. Everyone in the Senate worked together um, I couldn't have had a better team to work in the Senate with that bill, and it was great. Um, and you know that's a biennial funding. And so we look for 2023. Um, people are already working on their projects to submit next year. Um, we, we fund Lasart Sam's, the Outdoor Heritage, every year. We just had that in our committee. They have great projects. They did a wonderful job. Um, we look that forward to seeing that just go through um, 
just as easily as the other uh, legacy did last year. So um, next year, we'll, we if the sales tax keeps the way it's going, we'll have just a really wonderful bill uh, next year too. So I regret, I promised that we we're gonna get everybody in on that question and we're not because we're out of time. <laughs> so I wanna thank our distinguished panel of guests this evening for uh, their contributions to all of the uh, questions that we've asked. Uh, I wanna thank you, the viewers for joining us this evening. I want to remind you that this is your program and that you uh, will be uh, with us again in the weeks ahead. I do want to also remind you that next week there will be no program because Pioneer Public Television is having a pledge drive. So no program next week. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you and good night. Your Legislators is made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers. On the web at MFU.org.